I, I, I don't know what to make of this. I was going to thank you for braving your way through the cold and the, the political cold and the and the physical cold, um, which seem to be meeting these days. Um, but maybe that's why you're here, actually, a nice refuge. So welcome to the refuge of, uh, of the Southeast Asian Art Academic Program series with the Center for Southeast Asian Studies here at SOAS. So we are very pleased to have uh, Professor Marika Kloka with us this evening. We've been trying for a few years, actually, to get to get Professor Kloka with us. Um, and last night, I think we all had a panic when we saw that the trains from Brussels were canceled. Um, not due to Brexit, but due to uh, the weather, <laughs> apparently, apparently. Um, but she made it, so we're, I'm very, very happy to have her here. Um, so Marika is, uh, she's a professor at the University of Leiden. She is, as you all know, no doubt, uh, she is a specialist uh, of Indonesian materials. Uh, I think her title is Professor of Southeast Asian Art and Material Culture, if that's correct. And she, pri pre prior to, I'm very sorry, it's very crowded this evening. Uh, prior to taking up the, the, the teaching post uh, at the University of Leiden uh, in the early 90s, she worked um, as a curator at the Oriental Library at the University of Leiden and also at the Ethnology Museum in Leiden. Uh, so has a, a curatorial experience, which I think is um, quite important to, to the kind of work that, that she does and also the kind of work that we uh, aspire to do with, um, with Marika. Um, maybe I'll speak a bit to that uh, briefly as well. Um, that is, we, we do take a trip um, of our Southeast Asian uh, MA focus, our Southeast Asia focused students on the, on the MA to uh, European archives in France and in the Netherlands uh, every year. And uh, we have really benefited from Marika's expertise uh, during these trips and we will also benefit this year if I understand correctly. So um, we, have, we, have, uh, we are growing in dependence on Marika's expertise and really learning a lot from that. Um, so as you all know, no doubt, uh, Marika has published very extensively on uh, Hindu Buddhist materials from Indonesia, specifically from, um, from Java. Uh, I won't list all of, her, all of her many publications. I will note, however, that she has announced in coming here with us uh, a forthcoming publication, and I suspect that maybe we'll be hearing a bit of that this evening because the forthcoming publication is called A Golden Age of Temple Building in Java, 8th to 9th Centuries, Chronology and Historical Contextualization. And what Marika proposes to speak to, to, um, to us about this evening is ornamentation in, uh, I'm sorry, we must have another chair. Um, surely we'll find something. Um, uh, is ornament in central Javanese temples. And, um, she will be presenting, as I understand it, a, a chronology and um, a chronology <coughs> following stylistic development, um, the development of form uh, in ornament in particular. I'm sorry, one of our, one of our clearly honored guests is on the floor. <laughs> so, um, and I just want to, to pull out from the abstract that she shared with us, um, the incredible ambitions of this, and I hope we'll be hearing about this. It's really, it's really quite remarkable. No, it's it's really quite wonderful. I, I wanted to I wanted to really insist on it, and no doubt um, she will she will be able to fill us in. But looking at the ways that um, that, that that the study of ornament can enable um, solving of questions, as she says, of central Javanese history, and bringing clarity to the web of theories that have developed. I sort of want to make a point of this pedagogically for the students in the room as well. Um, we often think that our work is easier here in the 21st century because uh, in, the 20th, in the 20th century, people worked so hard and they developed the bases and the foundations and the historical facts and we can sort of move from there. But in fact, and that is true in many ways, but in fact something that Marika points out to me in this abstract is that um, our work is that much more difficult because there is a web, as you call it, that's a really nice word, there's a web of theories and a web of interpretations that need to be dealt with and worked through and the complexity of that can be that much more challenging than the complexity of establishing the <laughs> basics from nothing. 
um, in some ways. So that's it's a, it's an interesting um, point that we're at, I think, in um, in working on Southeast Asian art. So the ambitions, and I'm sure they will be fulfilled, um, as to where this will get us, is so the web of theories. For instance, on the date of Borobudur, on the Hindu Roro Jangran temple complex and connections to the Buddhist Shailindras, on relationships between Hindu and Buddhist kings in general, which is something that we've heard a lot about from, from Marika, um, but also a, a very important and ambitious topic. On relationships between northern and southern central Java, on fragmentation or centralization of the state, and on connections with East Java, Sumatra, and beyond. So um, we will learn a lot tonight, no doubt. And please join me in welcoming Professor Kelly. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for introducing me so elaborately. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here and to, um, to present to you some of this research on which I have been working for a very, very long period. And uh, it's only now that I see the end of this coming. So it's very nice for me to talk on this to you. And what I um, mentioned in the abstract was maybe a bit too ambitious for tonight, but you can find that all in the book that is going to be <laughs> forthcoming. Um, so let's uh, begin. Uh, who of you has been working on Indonesia? Not too many, so <laughs> that means, <laughs> and on Indonesian art, also not too many. So maybe it will be very specialist, and, but I hope you can take out these broad lines that I, uh, I think Ashley was shy. trying I to... Uh, <laughs> I think a bit people are being a bit shy okay. and they have a, a bit of knowledge. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So would anyone know how to date Borobudur? <laughs> no one dares? <laughs> okay. So, dating of Borobudur, there are various <laughs> theories, and here I give you a list of these, beginning with the first uh, proposing, the first scholars proposing dates. Um, Hendrik Kern, a Dutch Sanskritist who uh, thought it uh, dates from 850 to 900 on the basis of paleography. So on the base of Borobudur there are inscriptions. On the base of this writing he connected that with other inscriptions, dated inscriptions, and on the basis of that he thought he gave this, these dates. Um, but then new inscriptions um, were found and um, N.J. Krom, another Dutch scholar, he uh, placed the monument a century earlier um, on the basis of an inscription that was recently found then and was dated 760 AD. So he found relationships with that inscription. Um, uh, then there were others focusing on relationships with an old Javanese text, the Sangyang Kamahayanikan. Uh, then the Kasparis, who um, related the monument with an inscription dated 824, an inscription which he thought was the foundation inscription of the monument, the inscription of Kayumwungan. Um, well, quite complex, I'm not going to uh, mention all of this. Um, Dumarsay is interesting, Jacques Dumarsay, a French architect. He uh, didn't look at the inscription so much, but, r but rather on the methods of building. And um, so he saw that uh, a long time uh, would have been devoted to the building of uh, Borobudur, and this was actually the first time that someone proposed a quite long period for the building of Borobudur, from 775 to slightly after 830. 
Um, but then more recent research goes back again to the inscription of Kayum Wungan. Um, Kandag Jaya focuses on that and also Sundberg. He also places the monument in the time of uh, the king Rakai Warak, uh, around who was reigning in that period. Okay, so quite a lot of dates for Borobudur. Um, Another example, a, s a smaller temple complex, a Chandi Sambisari in the neighborhood of Jokyakarta, central Java, um, found, or found in the 1960s and excavated in the 1970s, uh, a small Hindu complex. The dates given for this uh, temple uh, are the following, and if you have a look at these, actually they cover the entire central Javanese period. So again, it seems scholars found it difficult to do the dating of temples in central Java. And Loro Jongrang, or also known as Prambanan, the largest Hindu complex in uh, central Java, also received different kind of dates. The early Dutch scholars thought it was the latest uh, temple complex of central Java, and therefore knowing the history of central Java, they dated it at the very end of the central Javanese period, in the early 10th century. But then um, de Casparis, he um, translated an inscription, the Shiva Gurha inscription, an inscription on the installation of a Shiva image in a temple complex. And this inscription gives some description of the temple and it appeared to be a quite big uh, compound. Uh, so on the basis of that, he suggested that uh, this inscription should be connected with this temple. Um, and um, so, uh, yeah, a problem in central Java is that there are no dated inscriptions on temples. Uh, so we do not get inscriptions on temples with a date. And this inscription was actually the origin is not very clear. It began to get moved and um, so it there this is what makes it difficult we do not know but because of the contents of this inscription a relationship was made with this big Hindu complex in uh, central Java uh, now I think the Kasparis is right uh, I still also think that the early Dutch scholars were right to suggest that it is stands at the end of developments and um, because of some recent inscriptions, or recently, more recently found inscriptions, the picture becomes a bit more clear, but it, because it appears that at the very end of the Central Javanese uh, period, um, there was a lot of trouble. So not too much trouble for kings to start such big uh, building projects. Uh, but then, if this inscription is connected with this temple, did the building start early, earlier, or did it continue later? So was the installation of this Shiva image, was this done at the beginning of the process or at the end of the process? So that also gives rise to different ideas of, um, uh, of the dating of the temple. Um, and then the last one in the row is Jordan, and he suggested an even earlier date than the others had given. Um, he suggested that this temple may have been, that the building began during the Buddhist Shailendra dynasty, so earlier on still. So, and this kind of shattered the yeah, the certainties that we thought we had, uh, because this also indicates why it is, it does matter what date we are giving to these temples, 
because if he's placing this in the Shailendra period, we will have to interpret it differently than if it's a later building. Uh, and um, he, it, I think it was because of his publications and one of his books is called Imagine Buddha in Prambanam. Uh, so he was quite uh, impressed by early Dutch scholarship that thought that this complex had something Buddhist to it, even though it is it is a Hindu complex. Uh, uh, I think it was uh, very much um, uh, because of ideas at that time about Hinduism. They didn't find too many images with too many arms and they didn't find erotic images and, and it had a very s m much more serene um, impression it gave. But um, I would say it's a completely Hindu complex, nothing Buddhist to this complex. Um, so, uh, he even suggested Borobudur and Prabhupadanam may, may be from around the same time. Okay, so you can see that these chronologies are based on uh, general interpretations of history that are based on dated inscriptions, on the paleography of inscriptions, uh, and ideas on their development, on building techniques, uh, also, stylistics have played a role. Some uh, scholars have done some uh, work on this, and then also combinations of this. Um, but again, Jordan, um, he writes, arguments of style do not cut much ice and had best uh, be abandoned. And I think this kind of triggered me to start to use arguments of style for argumentation. So that's when I, quite long ago, began this project on stylistic development of ornament on central Javanese temples. The, there are many temples in central <laughs> Java. This map might not show you very clearly their, all their names. Um, there are many more temples than indicated on this map. On this map are indicated only those temples that I use because they have ornaments. Uh, there are also remains of temples that do not have ornaments. Um, so, um, central Javanese uh, temples have a lot of ornament. And this can be a very useful source, I think, to, um, yeah, to date temples. So we find, um, do you know how this uh, is called, this head? Kala. Kala, yeah, you know that, good. <laughs> uh, actually, I don't know why this is called Kala, because, um, uh, well, you m others may know the Indian words for this, Kirti Mukha or Sima Mukha. Um, in actually, in old Javanese text, it's called Chaviri or Chavinten. It's not called Kala. So how they, somewhere, scholars started to decide, I think, that this is called Kala. And that's how it's now known, also in Indonesia. So I'll keep calling it Kala, even though I think it's not the right <laughs> term for this motif. Um, there are makaras, you might know those animals with the elephant uh, trunk. Uh, there are uh, patterns, repeat patterns on the walls. There are pilasters, there are these kind of dwarf-like figures that are sometimes called ganas or yapshas. Um, pillars and other configurations, this is also a very common uh, ornament, the spiral scroll ornament, we call it. Um, yeah, I was, um, uh, when I was began to work on this, I thought, as actually Ashley also seemed to suggest, that I was working on a very old fashioned subject. <laughs> and that actually this should have been something that my predecessors should have done, like for Khmer art and other mainland Southeast Asian fields, 
Um, but the Dutch scholars who were working uh, on these materials, they had a philological background and not an art historical background, so they didn't do it, I think. Um, um, so it was very nice for me to uh, find this recent book that uh, tells me that ornament is back in architecture but also in other media as well as in scholars rekindled interest in this subject more broadly. You know. It was not very easy, <laughs> I can tell you, uh, my research. I, there were some publications that were following this stylistic method. Uh, for instance, on this Kala head, uh, which I didn't think was very successful. And one of the reasons is, I think, because one, it focuses on only one ornament, and two, because it was going too much into detail. And that's what I ex continuously experience as difficult, that you tend to go into detail, but you have to keep a kind of overview of general development and what is important in a development and what is not important in a dev development. Uh, uh, then Java seems to have been a very complex, uh, Central Java, very complex um, region um, because it's very difficult to find these unilinear <coughs> kind of developments that you would like to find. Uh, there are not many of those over long periods. Uh, also, I experienced that a lot of new forms kept coming in to the repertoire of ornament. They came in through other media, from wood carving, from jewelry, from textiles. Uh, also Java seems to have been very open to the world at that time. Uh, the outside world, the Buddhist world. Um, and also the sculptors, they excelled in variation. I think they were great people doing this uh, ornament. Uh, they made beautiful ornament. Then also there seems to ha seem to have been periods when they, they did not follow on a line, but went back to earlier times. There are frequent restorations of temples. Uh, some temples show more than one building period, like Borobudur. Uh, also, we, it's not very clear what preceded Central Javanese art, although we have a bit more information now than when th around the time that I began this uh, research, because we now know there's West. There are things in West Java, in Batu Jaya, uh, and also what preceded it, because in East Java there's very little or there was very little, they are now also excavating more pieces. Uh, and be after the Central Japanese period, up to the Singosari period in uh, East Java, that begins in the 13th century. So there is to, there's a kind of gap between 10th and 13th century. Uh, and then there are no fixed dates. Uh, so, I will show a number of these challenges. Um, so here you can see this great, um, yeah, this variation that you can see in one ornament. Uh, uh, here we see a, a garland ornament in various forms uh, on Borobudur with birds, with um, flower rosettes, lotus rosettes, Another type of flower with a leaf, with uh, fronds, uh, with these kind of dwarf-like figures. Also the tops can be different, uh, the type of garland is different. There are many differences that you can see in this material. And I tried to <coughs> collect these and to um, see whether I could make uh, these kind of lines of development, but 
I got stuck actually. So I can I can put some forms together, uh, but then these do seem to be later than these. But what is the relationship with these? These also seem to be later than these. Uh, here, this is also definitely later than this. Uh, but here we see the same kind of um, upward point as we see here. Uh, what is the relationship between this one and that one? Um, then this is also a later development, clearly, to have leaf-like elements below the garland instead of beads. Uh, and there are other developments. It's quite complex. Um, so also um, an example of um, ornaments coming in from different materials. So this seems to me a very old ornament uh, in Java uh, that came in through woodworking, maybe already known through earlier woodworking traditions. Uh, this is on Chandi Mandut, this is on Chandi Banyu Nibo. Um, this is a relief on Borobudur where we also see it. This is a close-up of the figure that you find here. This seems to be a wooden building, so maybe this is indeed wood carving. We can also see it on thrones that might have also been of wood. Uh, but importantly, we also see it here on this um, seat on the elephant that surely was of wood and certainly not of stone. So this seems to make, seems to suggest an origin in wood carving. As far as I know, this ornament also doesn't exist elsewhere, uh, although it does in a later development pops up in uh, Khmer art. Um, it's for instance on Angkor Wat, but I would be interested to know if you can also find it earlier than Angkor Wat. Another one that came through wood carving is this one that I call the foliate grid ornament. It's also known in the literature as Trishula Chakra ornament. This was uh, a name um, made up by Dutch scholars early on and recent scholars also seem to adopt it but there doesn't seem to be any relationship with chakra, chakra or trishula to me so I'm sticking to foliate grid ornament and that's another one that's found on the carriage that brings uh, Queen Maya to Lumbini and also seems to suggest an origin in wood carving. It's also an ornament that you do not find in uh, other places. Uh, I did find it on Lolai in, is that how you pronounce it? Lolai. Lolai, yeah. Uh, in Roluas, that's the only example I have found so far. Uh, then, of course, um, ornaments that have an origin in uh, textiles. Here is an example of a golden uh, plate with a couple, divine couple, and she is wearing this textile. That gives us two patterns that we can also find on uh, central Javanese temples. This one is on Gedong Songo too and this one on Punta Deva, one of the temples on Dieng. So this one you can find vertically here, and this one is here. Uh, quite well known, I think, is um, this uh, textile on Chandi Sewu, a big Buddhist complex, uh, on its outer walls. Uh, already quite some time ago, um, Hiram Woodward um, wrote about this and he suggested it had a Chinese origin and he made connections with Chinese textiles. 
Uh, more recently, Sandra Sargiono in a PhD thesis that was defended in Berkeley um, shows that actually it doesn't copy a Chinese textile but is composed of, it, it got inspired by both Chinese textiles, specifically this floral kind of pattern that you find here, uh, but also by the uh, pearl roundels type of uh, textiles that you can find in Central Asia. Um, but she also showed that it was all made together into um, something that is nevertheless uniquely Javanese and unique for this particular <coughs> temple. Uh, then maybe also from jewelry, and here is an example of an, a band ornament consisting of um, ovals and small uh, flowers that you can also find here. Uh, but this ornament seems to have been very popular in a certain time and I also found it as the border of a textile and also on, um, on a throne, I think. Yeah, on a throne. So um, this one moved uh, to various media. Um, yeah, also uh, Java was open to the outside world and I can find connections in ornament between various regions uh, with Dwaravati. There is this kind of uh, uh, band ornament with small scrolls that suddenly appears in Java. There is an ornament that is, seems to be quite similar to me. This one is on Banyu Nibo in Java, this one in, um, in Cambodia. Uh, as far as I know, this doesn't occur very often in Cambodia. It's specific for this temple and also in Java, it's specific to this te temple. So one wonders what is the connection. Um, this ornament seems very similar to this ornament in South India, in Kanchipuram. Um, it seems to me quite un-Indian actually, um, so maybe there was also um, transportation of ornament from the east to the west instead of from the west to the east as we usually assume. Uh, here with Champa, here with Sri Lanka and then also the peony flower with uh, China. So here is this peony flower. So while at first in Javanese art it seems we only get lotus flower uh, with a clear heart uh, and the leaves always eight or, or four and, and four between or eight and six uh, making up 16. Um, suddenly this type of flower that resembles the peony, is that how you pronounce Pe that? Pe 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 peony. Okay. Um, appears also on Chandi Banyu Nibo, specifically a temple that seems very Chinese to me. Um, and also the leaves, this type of leaf we get that goes with it in Chinese art. Here is a, a textile from the Tang Dynasty showing such a flower, quite similar it seems to me, dated to exactly the same time that I would date uh, Banyu Nibo. Um, yeah, this is the, the archa archaisms that you can get into the motifs. Uh, this is what is called an antifix in uh, Javanese art. It's maybe you know it as Gavaksha, is that the term in Indian art, or uh, Kudu? Well, that's the thing that you find in a slightly different form in central Javanese temples, and it's called antifix uh, in the literature. Uh, this is from Borobudur, and early on you get these things on a base, that looks like this, a molded base. And
And then suddenly they stopped doing that and then the base is decorated with um, squares, circles, combination of those that's ornament with a flower, a similar kind of ornaments, even a garland uh, you can find. And they didn't do this anymore, they dropped it completely. But then in the la last phase, and I do think this is the last phase, they did reinvent it again. Uh, so they, they got back to this idea of the base. But then it has a different form. Um, often it's, it's broken in the middle to let a bell down into that space. Uh, and there are other characteristics that make me think that nevertheless this is later. Uh, and for instance, that there are five points on this antifix, another late development. Um, I think I'll skip this one. Uh, then, uh, yeah, even on Borobudur itself, of course, this is a very big uh, monument, huge to uh, sculpture, so we can imagine that it took quite a long uh, period of time to do this. Uh, interestingly, uh, I found that, uh, I think that in general, one was working from uh, the from downstairs to upstairs uh, but it is interesting to see that even on the first gallery so lowest we get an ornament and it's not finished so people were working on this and one person didn't finish or something or that for some reason they, they forgot or they had, had to go on or uh, I don't know so we also have to realize that this also happened, that they didn't finish and that maybe some of the ornament was, even though on the first gallery, someone later on thought, hey, this is not finished, let's finish it now. Uh, that makes it quite complex. But nevertheless, the big lines seem to be that one was working from bottom to top. Um, so here, this is how one began with this kind of garland and here we get in this pearl roundel that we have also seen on this textile pattern. It seems to me related to this slightly later style when we get this, yeah, this influx from China or maybe even directly the Central Asia or through the Middle East somehow. Um, and in the very latest stage, we get a different type of flower. Uh, with So here we see this characteristic um, lotus-like flower with always these A8 uh, petals or 16. Um, but then suddenly a flower appears with only five or six petals and differently shaped, which seems to me also I can I find it in <coughs> Chinese art of the same period. Um, and this is an example that also shows five petals, but in Chinese art there are also many examples with six uh, uh, petals, and that's what we also find in Borobudur. But this one is all again, it seems a later development, and it seems to be at the very top of the monument. Okay, so by now you may already be completely, oh, what is this, all these details. Um, yeah, for me it was uh, also very difficult and um, one of the things is also that um, you're working a lot with your eyes and what your eyes are doing is often not considered very scientific. Uh, so. I too was doubting what I am seeing, am I right or am I not right? And I was wondering this, that, how should I get all this? It was actually for me like learning a new language and actually a language that had not been studied before. I needed to memorize the words, I needed to get the structure of the grammar, I needed to get the feeling for the nuances of the speech and um, 
this is actually my case study that made me think, yes, I can trust my eyes. Uh, this is a um, makara in the Rijksmuseum. It has been there for a long time and none of the cura curators or any other scholar had ever been able to get its origin. After I had been looking at these motifs for some uh, years, I came back to the Rijksmuseum, I saw this makara and I thought this is Sewu style, the style of Chandi Sewu and related temples in the neighborhood, but also on Mandut. So I recognized this style. Then I started to look in my photographs and to see whether I could pinpoint it more clearly. And um, so here I also want to show you that actually if you look clearly, there's pieces broken here. There used to be another pearl string coming from the mouth of the lion and going down here. So this is a makara with a lion in the beak, very common ornament in uh, central Java, also found on Borobudur. Uh, and the style of Borobudur and Sewu are quite close, but nevertheless I, I decided, yes, this is Sewu style. I went back to my photographs and then I found, yes, indeed, and it resembles most the makaras that are on the entrances of Chandi Sewu itself. Um, in particular, it, it's a bit difficult maybe to see. I don't know whether you see the, that they're very similar. Uh, sometimes you really need uh, photographs that are taken from exactly the same perspective to be able to show very clearly that they are the same. Um, here I try to take the uh, side view, um, but the problem is this makara is up high and this one is standing low, so again I get a different kind of perspective. Uh, but there are two elements that are specific for this temple, and uh, for the entrance of this temple, and that is that the makara is cut in such a way that part of the circle that was here um, is on the post, not on the piece with the makara. So as you can see here, uh, here it's also disappeared, but it was here originally on the post. That's one element that's characteristic for these pieces. And this is another element that's characteristic for them. There is a pearl uh, string going down here and then moving forward and then down again. It, you do not find that anywhere except for this temple. They did it on all the eight makaras of this temple complex, the entrances. There are four entrances and there are two of these makaras on, bo on both sides. Um, yeah, so this is the uh, temple, a large Buddhist temple complex. Uh, this is the entrance. So, yeah, if um, <coughs> if this um, was on this temple, then it means one uh, at least one makara should be missing, and it should be one that was on the right side of the entrance. And yes, indeed, there's one makara missing, <laughs> mm -hmm. and it's on the main entrance, the eastern entrance. You see it here, but this is a modern uh, re. Yeah, they they try to outline, give the outline. I mean, it's on the entrance, the main entrance. It's not nice to have, uh, uh, um, yeah, to have nothing there. So in the last restoration, they gave the outlines of a makara on a, a recent piece. So that's where it uh, comes from. And here is its companion. Mm -hmm. And here you can see that at this side, but it's uh, the only side they decided to have the makara with the uh, circle here on one piece instead of like this. Okay. 
Um, yeah, you can look at details and then see more and more similarities, like this, the way how this is done. The very elegant and quite um, uh, slender horn, also a slender uh, or narrow uh, neck band, done very similarly, etc. Okay, so um, when I was uh, first, when I began, so for me it was uh, quite complex, but the first thing I saw was a difference between early Central Javanese and late Javanese uh, in various motifs. So uh, for instance, in band ornaments, in the early period, you get these kind of uh, bands and in the late period you get more floral and foliate elements in these band ornaments you can see so here we have pilasters and that four lobed motif that I already showed you earlier here we find the elaborate form that's much more foliate in a very late form Uh, and then this uh, small band, or, or this band with uh, small four-petaled flowers, that uh, seems to me to be a very easy marker to distinguish the late style, because it um, it uh, seems to appear quite suddenly, and then it's it became very popular, so you can find it on many temples. It was used quite a lot. Uh, at first it seems to have been uh, this type of uh, band with a scroll ornament, but then it developed and, uh, and this became the standard into an ornament with the same flower, but with this uh, oval kind of shape. Another element that is easy to tell early Central Javanese and late Central Javanese apart is uh, found in the tops of garland ornaments and specifically in the later period you get uh, this composition with uh, six uh, leaves, I call it the six leafed uh, motif but maybe it these are petals and a flower is suggested um, in various forms, but the, the characteristic thing is this six-leafed motif. Uh, whereas here there are four elements in the early period and very early it seems they were looking at natural flowers and this is rather a lotus flower and maybe a, a blue lily. Uh, so, this is uh, most characteristic of this early period on the one hand and the late period on the other hand. And you can find that six leaf mo motif also seems to have become very popular and you find it anywhere in a lot of other ornaments as well. Also in uh, antifixes, like here in the top of an antifix, also in the side of the antifix, in a border ornament uh, here, uh, more of them in antifix, also in the band on the antifix, in a repeat pattern on Chandi Plausan, in uh, another type of ornament on Loro Jongrang, uh, in a corner forced into a triangle triangular form uh, and here in a spiral scroll ornament so this seems to me also an easy marker to identify a late central Javanese style uh, also in the makaras you can see clear uh, distinctions in the band ornament with the early uh, ones having squares and circles or a combination of those 
and the later one uh, developing a band with leaf-like elements, as you can see here. Okay, so that was early and late. And um, then within those, uh, I, could, I started to see differences between Borobudur style, what I call Borobudur style, which I think is the earliest, uh, Sewu style, the second. So both are within my early style. I can distinguish Borobudur and Sewu. And in the late style, I also distinguish two styles, the Ijo Plausan style and the Loro Jongrang style. Um, so in this antifix, for instance, you see this uh, uh, pedestal-like uh, uh, base that we have already seen in the early uh, ones. But we also see that the, um, the ornaments uh, defines the outline of the antifix. You can see that they went to, uh, to a lot of trouble to, to carve this along with the lines of the ornamentation. Uh, but then in the late period they decided it would, it would be easier to cut it straight and the ornament is made to follow the form of the uh, antifix. Uh, we see three, we, th we see antifixes in the Ijo Plauson style specifically with three points and then later develops a form with five points. Uh, also, uh, uh, and in the Loro Jongrang style, this five pointed form becomes the form that all antifixes have, have small or big, uh, and we find these nicely curved forms. Also, you can see there is a difference in the kind of um, central element. I call this pear shaped and this arch shaped. So the arch shaped form came in in, in the Sevu style. It continued in the in Ijo Plauson style, but was more or less dropped in the Loro Jongrang style, which got back to this uh, pear shaped style again. In the Kala head, you can also see differences. The Borobudur ones have one point, the ones at Sevu are flat topped. Um, they hang often on the uh, upper um, bar. Uh, also characteristic for this style are these garlands that come from the mouth of these uh, kalas. Uh, then, oops, here. Uh, you can see that here they have only an upper jaw in the early period, then in the late period, we get a form with a lower jaw and also <coughs> um, paws are placed on the sides of the head. So this is what we see in the Ijo Plauson style. And then in the uh, Loro Jongrang style, the paws get raised upwards and they seem even more threatening maybe, maybe if you would like to give some more general uh, definition to this. Uh, so these are the among the latest. Uh, it doesn't mean that the, all the old forms were dropped. In the Loro Jongrang style, we also find the Kala with only the upper jaw, with here another one with only the upper jaw but with paws um, here with lower jaw and pose paws downward and here with them raised upward so in this latest style you also get all of them together but how do we know that they are late <laughs> because they are five pointed because here we get this kind of base with a, a break in between 
Um, uh, we also have the, um, uh, the six-leafed uh, motif, etc. Okay, um, that was the first half of my talk, and now I wanted to show you some, but I, I don't know what, up to what time do I have actually? <laughs> I there, we have the room until seven, so um, you know, okay, it's okay. just a question of your Okay, energy. so um, uh, I will in any case give one example of how we can use this for dating uh, monuments, so I will first focus on Borbudo and I'll see if I have time for some other examples. Um, Borobudo, we can see on the monument that there were different phases of building uh, because as you can see here there was an original original foot of the monument and this with a series of reliefs very nicely carved reliefs 160 panels showing the Mahakarma Libanga uh, text a uh, Buddhist text uh, but this was covered up at a certain time. Uh, it seems to me they covered it because the monument was falling apart. That's why they had to build such a very thick wall against it, uh, as you can see here. So they opened up in the during the last restoration. They opened up uh, this part for the visitor to see some of this, but the reliefs are going around the monument and we cannot see them anymore because they are behind this wall. <coughs> they were, oh, it was, or oh, the complete wall was opened and there are photographs that have been taken. Um, I think the originals are kept in Leiden. Uh, in the National Museum of Ethnology, and you can find them through their website. <coughs> uh, so we can see that they were doing things in the building and changing things. This is another one that has been discussed. This is the first, so here you are on the first <coughs> gallery. Uh, this is the first balustrade, um, but here this is done differently than on the other balustrades and the impression it gives is that at first they wanted to make a low balustrade and this is just the top of that low balustrade and it was only later on that they decided to put other elements on top of that and to make the balustrade higher. Um, yeah, of course you can see these things, but then it's also difficult to give datings to these uh, elements of architecture, because when did they place that big wall against these reliefs? Um, well, it's clear from the reliefs that the reliefs were not finished yet, so it must have been during the process of finishing the reliefs, but then, yeah, um, in this case, did they, did, did they begin building like this and then they immediately decided, oh, this is too low, we have to add this, or did they come to that insight after they had done this uh, building? Okay, so you can get these kind of ideas of the building phases of Borobudur. This is from Du Marseille, the French architect I uh, talked about. Um, this is from a um, uh, kind of popular publication uh, with nice colored images that makes clear how he saw it, although his description in the text doesn't completely fit with what we see in the images, and Du Marseille has written a lot on this in several publications, and none of his publications say actually all the time the same. So apparently he was also wondering how to decide. But it is illustrative to show you this. Uh, so uh, first they made these first two parts, then 
they um, yeah this part they did it like this then they changed the plan instead of this bigger stupa they decided to make a smaller stupa at the top and to uh, have these circular terraces with smaller stupas surrounding it um, and here is this in this phase he also places this first gallery this addition of the first uh, balustrade so he thinks it was done at the same time that this big wall was added to the monument. Uh, no, sorry, this is when he thinks they did the low balustrade, so quite late in the process. And here they added the niches with the Buddhas on top of this at the very last stage. And then they also added here these staircases. Okay, we can see also in the ornamentation <coughs> that there is a difference between the, um, the um, balustrades of the top floors. They all conform to this um, configuration with Kala head and, and Makaras on an arch that is carried by pilasters. Uh, and this one has a different kind of configuration without Kala head. Uh, these these are stupas. These are different. Have different shape, uh, etc. Um, <coughs> this is the 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 inner side of that balustrade uh, with the Jataka Mala series of reliefs, um, and here we also see the antifixes. The antifixes on the balustrade are also different from those on the other parts of the monument. So while this is the common form on the other galleries, this is the one that you find on the balustrade sides without a, this molded base. And this is the type that you find on the main walls. Uh, but on the balustrade of this first gallery, you find a different type, as you can see. Uh, specifically, you can see there is a difference in the top. Mm. So this one has this foliage, and this one seems to have a pot-like uh, shape. And this is uh, actually a form that you do not find a lot. This is quite common in the early period, but this is not. You seem to find it only in a very limited uh, period. Uh, and this relates this part of the, um, uh, of the mon monument um, to the Sevu style. So the style that is just after the Borobudur style. Uh, so here, this one is from Sevu. This one is the one from Borobudur. You can see there is a big similarity. But on Sewu it was developed further, so it seems to me that Sewu was the origin of this form and, and they were elaborating on that form and adding elements, making makaras in the form, <coughs> etc. Okay, so um, yeah, I think and this is just one example, but if you study other ornaments as well, uh, I see relationship in the first gallery with the Sevu style. So that's the style immediately following on the Borobudur style. Uh, then I said you can see a development from uh, the bottom to the top. There are pilasters in all galleries, so we can kind of follow quite easily how that worked. This is in the first gallery. Uh, this is a quite um, yeah, broad pillar, it seems, with this antifix motif, uh, characteristic for the Borobudur style. In the second gallery, so in the first gallery, you have two sets of reliefs, and these pilasters are there to separate panels of relief and they are only on the lower series, they are in between the lower series, so they're, they're, they're shorter than in the other galleries where there's just one series of reliefs, so the, the reliefs are taller, 
So they decided, based on this type, to add another um, part with antifixes here. But then here on the third gallery, you see that a new element is entering. It is this beaded um, line um, that may be related to this entering also of this pearl roundel uh, that you find in the Servu style. Uh, so I think this is again an element of the Servu style. And in this last one, so they kept the extra layer here, extra moldings here. But here they dropped it because they added an another new element, and that is a pot-shaped element on the top and the bottom. And both of these you find in the Savu style. So again, it seems to me from the Borobudur style, it was moving up to the Savu style uh, on Borobudur. So here are some examples where you find the same in the Savu style, uh, Mandut and Savu itself uh, here. I think I'm going to skip this. Uh, then, uh, so I see a lot of um, development towards the Savu style, but I also see a development into the Plausan style. Um, although not as much as the Savu style. So it seems there were details that were left to be done and some of these were done in the Plausan style. Um, on the fourth balustrade, strangely, we find a type of Kala head that has these spiral-shaped eyes and also the makaras have this type of eye. Uh, this is something that starts to begin in this on Chandi Savu it seems also but maybe it's more or less same time uh, on Chandi Savu but on Chandi Savu you see them appear both kalas with this type of eye and makaras on parts that have clearly been restored at a later time so it's late Savu. Uh, and that develops into the Plauson lore style, as you can see here. You can see the spiral eye eyes become much bigger and more prominent. Uh, okay, the same I actually already showed you, we see happen in the garland ornament and these pearl roundels uh, related to Savu. This is on Chandigana, that's very near to Sevu. Uh, and the flower, that is a Plauson Lord type of flower that uh, we find on some of the ornaments at the top uh, level. So then, of course, we could also try to find this ornament, this band ornament that I said is characteristic for the late style that begins with the Plauson style. And um, yeah, we do find it, but we do not find it very prominently. We only find it on these kind of details, like on the elephant's band and on the back of this uh, seat. Um, it seems either this ornament had not yet entered into the stone, uh, into the repertoire of stone ornaments, or this was maybe done at a very late stage. One can imagine that yeah, people who were there and they saw the, a band ornament, it was not decorated, they decided I will decorate this. Uh, and it was done later. That's also a possibility. But my final uh, example that for me is very telling and shows that they were working until the Plauson style is this image of a Buddha on the fourth main wall, so at the top level of reliefs. Um, it's the only one, but this one has this typical uh, band ornament on the border of the uh, halo, which is also has a flame uh, border, and that's the typical 
Plauson style uh, element that you find on Buddhas and Bodhisattvas from Chandi Plauson, uh, the Plauson temple. So this for me is uh, the most clear evidence that <coughs> they were working <coughs> on the monument up to that period, but not later than that. Uh, so not up to the Loro Jongrang period. I do not see any overlap between Borobudur and Loro Jongrang. So the idea of Roy Jordan that they can be seen as twin pinnacles of early central Javanese culture, uh, I do not see it in the ornament. Okay, I wanted to add some history, but maybe I will skip that because maybe for you, you are not too much maybe into all this history, but of course it is important. Uh, this is an important inscription, the Wanuatunga 3 inscription that was found in 1983. Uh, and it was important because it gave us a list of kings um, we did know a list of kings. Um, this is in an inscription of King Balitung, so one of the later kings of the Central Javanese period. Uh, we knew an inscription by the same king in which he also mentioned uh, previous kings, but that list was not complete. Uh, in that list he only needed the successful kings, so he also mentioned those. Uh, in this li list, he also <coughs> mentions the not very successful kings who had only very brief reigns, like this one. Uh, and here we can see that this later period was quite complex because there were a lot of rulers uh, with brief reigns. Um, but this is an important inscription because it tells us that um, a grant to a land grant to a Buddhist monastery was established by this king. It was maintained by this king. Then it was dissolved, it, the inscription tells us, by this king. This one kept it dissolved. This one re-established the uh, grant, then this one dissolved it again and it was kept dissolved until King Balitung decided to re-initiate it again. Uh, and this was for poli political motives, uh, he, he quite honestly tells us. Uh, um, Why do I tell you this? <laughs> um, for me, it seems that what I see in the art historical record um, seems to fall nicely onto this, what we see here, that Buddhist, a Buddhist, Buddhist monastery is stimulated and uh, this seems to fall nicely together with my Borobudur Sewu period. Then there seems to be a bit of a gap, and that's why we can so clearly distinguish between early uh, Central Java and late Central Java, because it doesn't flow fluently from, from early to, s to late. Things are happening, is it this kind of gap? This king is said not to be the son of this one, but to be the son of someone else, someone associated with a place and we don't know the place. Um, so apparently this is not a line of father to son, and not always, in any case this one is, is not connected with, does not seem connected with the previous one. So, um, uh, so it, it, I see again it beginning, and this would then conform to my Ethiopian style. 
Um, and this is now also becoming more clear that this king should be connected with the Plausan temple. I will show that later. Uh, and then this, these two kings seem to be connected with the building of, uh, of Loro Jongrang. Uh, and um, they, th especially this one, clearly uh, manifests himself as a Shaivit uh, king. Uh, this one, Buddhist again. Uh, it's, yeah, difficult, uh, but I seem to see this alternation of Buddhist Hindu, while in scholarship it's always questions, questions, and <coughs> even it's said it's an old-fashioned idea to suggest that if two re religions are living together that there will be fights, but it seems to me there is something like that, and they are alternating each other. Actually, I place Dieng and Gedong Songo, that are usually placed at the very beginning, I place them here. Uh, too complex to explain. Uh, so this is the Plausan Lor Temple. It has inscriptions. It's a very big complex, again, with two major temples. Uh, with female donors, it seems, uh, in this temple, and uh, male donors in this temple. Um, there were many secondary sh shrines surrounding this uh, complex, and these have inscriptions. Um, they tell us who donated buildings. Uh, and interestingly, um, they give some information on people who donated. Um, there are quite a number of uh, inscriptions that tell this is a donation of Shri Maharaja. Uh, and there are two here that tell us that this is the stupa that was uh, donated by Sri Maharaja Rakai Pikatan. Because we here get a name of a king, it was always suggested that this was the king who built this temple complex, and this happens to be also the, uh, a king that is connected with Loro Jongram. Hence this idea that Plausan, Lor, Buddhist and Loro Jongrang Hindu were donations of the same king who had married a, a, a Buddhist queen. Um, but it now seems to become clearer that Sri Maharaja is not this uh, Sri Maharaja Rakai Pikatan. Uh, um, because we now know through this Wanuatanga 3 inscription that Rakai Pikatan had as his personal, personal name Jah Saladu. So it seems that he first donate, made do donations to this stupa, uh, these two stupas, when he was not yet king. And he was still known as Rakai Gurunwangi Jah Saladu. And so it was the earlier king. Oh, I think this is too complex. I leave it here. Uh, anyway, this um, um, all this does seem to give us quite clear dating of this one temple, and it seems to be connected with this Rakai Garung, who um, was a completely forgotten king, I think, who reigned in the second quarter of the ninth century and seems to me to have been a very important one. It is in this period that I see um, most clearly a, a kind of unification in the ornamentation and similar ornaments. I mean, they're never completely the same because the Japanese <coughs> sculptors were very creative. Um, but um, similar as this, you do not get it in another period. And these are examples of this type of antifix, also specific for this period, that you find <coughs> spread over central Java. And not even that, you also um, find it in East Java, as I will argue, 
on Chandi Badut um, and in Sumatra. In Chandi Badut, Chandi Badut was discovered in 1923 and then it was immediately connected to that inscription that I already mentioned early on, that inscription of 760. It's an inscription in East Java uh, and because it was the inscription was found quite, or the temple was found quite near to the place where the inscription was found, um, immediately uh, the scholars decided this temple has a central Javanese style, so it should date from this early period, same date as the inscription. This was also connected to Chinese information. Chinese information of 700 uh, tells us that between 742 and 755 there was a move to the east. So they thought, um, they interpreted this as a move from central Java to east Java. Uh, I now think it actually was a move from West Java to Central Java, so also an Eastern move, but another Eastern move. Um, and then stylistics were used either to confirm that date or sometimes they did not confirm that date and they were th uh, it was suggested to be a much later building connected rather with the move from Central Central Java to East Java in the early 10th century. And uh, that is also what Jordan, I have been mentioning him a lot, but he has been doing a lot of work on these things. Um, and uh, he suggested the uh, temple should be connected to the eastward expansion of Central Java at the end of the 9th and beginning of the 10th century. He wrote an article on this and then he used also ornaments. Um, yeah, he was inspired by others and then he used this ornament on the temple. This is again this foliate grid ornament uh, as um, <coughs> part of his argu argumentation to, um, to uh, suggest this very late date. But as far as my, he is actually not an art historian, so he was using this and, and he said we should also use other ornaments, but he didn't go into them and he, he didn't do it. He said others should do that. Um, so that's what I'm doing now. Um, so he um, thought this is an ornament that you find only late in central Java. But as I have tried to show you, it seems to me to be a very old motif in Java based on earlier wood carving tradition. And um, the fact that this form is different from the central Javanese form seems to me to maybe even support this idea that it was a kind of general ornament and that here in, Cent in East Java they used their own form of this uh, ornament, um, the characteristic circular heart shape is not here in this one, uh, but it is in all central Javanese uh, forms of this ornament. Uh, and it's found in the um, early on on Sevo, on Plausan Lor, and also on Loro Jongran indeed. Uh, but if we look at other ornaments at on this temple, it uh, shows to me that it belongs to the Ichio Plauson style, so the style of this King Rakai Garum. Uh, so these are examples. Ngawen is also a um, temple belonging to that style, and these are quite similar to each other. More similar, you don't get antifix, is very similar actually. Uh, this uh, is the same, also quite similar uh, at Badut, but also at Plausan, Lor and Ijo. <coughs> There's a garland ornament with these leaf-like elements, which makes clear it is late, um, but it's specifically uh, similar to the form we find in Plausan, Lor. Also the Kinara that is depicted here 
is in the form that you find in this Ijo uh, Plauson Lor style and not in the form with the wings spread as in the Loro Jongran style. Another uh, repeat pattern that you find at Badut and Plauson Kidul um, is this one. So yeah, for me it seems clear that clear that this temple does not date early, does not la date li late, but dates from this uh, Ichio Plauson Lor style period of Rakei Garum. And this is a period when we see this kind of unification in ornamentation and uh, it seems that it's also spreading. It, it's so similar that yeah, what is the relationship? Uh, uh, and why would there be, there's another temple was found, uh, it's no longer there, but pieces of that temple are still at the site of the Badut temple. It has the same uh, style, it was found nearby, Chandi Besuki. Um, so why would there be a place here? that's connected with central Java in the second quarter of the ninth century. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I have some ideas, but they are very speculative. Um, okay, I'll leave that for the moment. Uh, then also there is a temple si Mangambat in uh, southern north Sumatra that uh, was discovered in 1888 and then was um, uh, was discussed by Boss in 1930. He thought it was very important because it also showed a central Javanese style. Then Mr. Schnitker went there to do excavations and he thought it was 8th century, uh, but maybe the 9th was also possible. Um, then it was forgotten the site until in 1973 there was a team doing research in Sumatra finding archaeological remains and they just documented that what was still there in at the site uh, but it seems the pieces were covered under the ground again and it's only recently that the National Research Center of Archaeology in Indonesia uh, began to do excavations anew, so they are. So this site has been dug up, then covered again, dug up again. Pieces have also been moved in the meantime. Uh, so there's not much left, but what is left seems to me to also um, show relationships with this Ijo Plauson style. Here we find this. Um, uh, foliate grid ornament with actually this typical central Javanese form, very similar it seems to me to the one on Chandi Kedulan, Kedulan. Uh, this type of antifix motif is also shows relationship with that style and then finally we find also in old photographs they do not seem to be there anymore we find this specific type of antifix that is so characteristic for this Plauson Ijo period um, and here are we both find the form with the arch going up and the form with the with the heart shape um, both are found on different temp on the same temple in the Ijo Plauson style so that seems to be for me the yeah again another a clear um, element to identify this uh, temple also as belonging to this period. And again, one could wonder why we find this here. And now uh, we do know that this period was, uh, is, is still a period where they find gold, a lot of gold. Um, and we know that the Maharajas of uh, <laughs> of Java were also famous for for the gold. And but Java itself is not uh, rich in in gold, nor in any other uh, metals. It seems so. 
yeah, maybe there is a connection because of the gold, and then because of this gold, I was thinking, what would be a connection with that other place, Badut in East Java? And then I found that that place is actually, nowadays, it's known because of uh, the, the fine white uh, clay that you find there and other uh, materials that you need to make this nice white um, wares that are also made in China. So I was thinking, would it be possible that they already knew this early on and that maybe they already, I don't know how you can find how you can research this, actually, I think we need archaeologists for this, but um, yeah, there white wares have been found, for instance, in Chandi Sehu, a white uh, earthenware uh, shirt has been found, which is said to be Chinese, but maybe it was uh, Eastern Java. <laughs> uh, this is just speculation and um, I don't know what to make of this, maybe a suggestion for some research. It seems to me that this is partly also this kind of yeah, speculation but that this period was a very important period. This is also the period when we have the um, first um, ship wreck with a mass of Chinese wares apparently heading to Java, uh, it's the same period. Um, there is this talk in <coughs> Arabic sources on the Sri Maharaja, the Maharajas of the Southern Seas, and there is this person, Maha Sri Maharaja, who calls himself just Sri Maharaja on the Plauson Temple, and there's also an inscription in Sumatra, another place in Sumatra, uh, no, not Sumatra, it's in Thailand, southern Thailand. This inscription also talks of someone who is named Sh Maharaja. So, um, yeah, it, it seems to me that this was a very important king and we have completely forgotten him. Mm -hmm. That's it, and I think I'm not gone too much. We have we have time for questions if you're okay with yeah, okay. The floor is open. question but you had a an early slide which showed um, motifs architectural motifs that were you said Java was open and they came from um, Champa and Sri Lanka and, and architecture doesn't travel so I was just wondering how these motifs were exchanged I mean yeah um, yeah I my I think because that's also a thing we do not find um, I, for instance um, it has often been suggested that there are links between um, Cham art and Indonesian art. The dating is not right because in Cham literature it's often said that it's 10th century, but in 10th century Java, I think this is based on the early idea that uh, Laura Jongram dates from the 10th century, but that's already long gone, but it seems in Champa studies that's kind of continued. In 10th century Java, there is little to compare with. Uh, um, but these things have been mentioned. Uh, also with India, I think it's John Guy who quite, yeah, who, who, who suggests relationships with, um, with the early Chalukyas in southern India. And indeed, I feel there is similarity. Uh, I feel I, c I feel I can date Indian uh, architecture ornaments on the basis of my knowledge of uh, Javanese ornament. But if you want to make really clear comparisons and really find motifs that are really very close to each other, you will find little, little, some things, bits, but so. 
obviously they yeah they sometimes yes maybe they did go to temples um, uh, for instance this spiral scroll ornament in a certain period you get a lot of these uh, spirals going together parallel on each other and um, I was wondering whether it might be based on people visiting uh, the stupa at Sarnat, where you find quite similar kind of flowers and quite similar kind of... <coughs> so that could be that people were going to places and bringing some things back, but from memory they didn't have photographs, yeah, they could maybe have made drawings at, at the place, I don't know, but... Um, and, and partly maybe also through uh, other media like textiles, I think that is that was a, a also a major, huh? <laughs> actually, major uh, force to to carry ornaments. Uh, but also jewelry, I, I suspect. I see in South India, I see jewelry on statues that are only found in gold in Java, not in. India. <coughs> Maybe they existed in India and it, yeah, gold you, you can easily melt down to make something new. But in Java these and also the Kala head is Javanese like. Actually Indian Kalas do not seem to me very similar to Javanese ones except in <coughs> certain cent, uh, South Indian examples they, they do look a bit <laughs> Javanese like. Yeah, that's uh, the answer. Um, do your comments on ornamentation and tracing the evolution, do they apply equally to contemporaneous bronze sculptures? <coughs> the two? Bronze. Bronze, bronze sculptures from Java. Of a similar <coughs> way. So the ornamentation on bronze. Mm -hmm. Is it similar to what you see on stone? And uh, you at the same time. Yes, yeah. at the same time. Yeah. You applied, does um, your argument also apply to bronze? Um, not so much, because it was not ornamented in that way. Yes, yeah, sometimes, yes, I do. Yeah, the talams, for instance, the, the things that are called talam in the literature, uh, it's not the correct term again, I think, uh, but these are these um, yeah, trays to carry for offerings, uh, and the central Javanese ones, they have a, a, yeah, an ornament in the center, and often it's um, a lotus flower, and I see this, this Chinese, so in my Sevu style, I see most connections with China, this in flux from China seems most apparent in the in the Savu style, even the Urshis, the, the sages on the temple, they sometimes really look like Chinese people, Chinese people with, with these long moustaches and, and small pointed beards, not like the Indian ones, <laughs> like the Indian sadhus. Um, um, even for Indonesians, they look like Chinese people. There's a piece in the, in the museum in Yogyakarta and, and it's written on the label, the Chinese people. So, um, uh, yeah, so that period uh, on the, these talons, I can also see this kind of Chinese uh, yeah, flower, peony, peony, peony flower, yeah, for instance. But, it, yeah, then, but on, there are bronze images they do not have a lot of ornamentation except for the back pieces, but they are different. They are they do not show this typical Plauson style uh, back piece. Um, yeah, maybe the six leaf motif would be something to see if it's found on uh, yeah. Could be an interesting uh, other subject. Yeah. A related question to that, actually, which comes to mind because you mentioned the, the shipwreck or Belitung cargo. Um, in terms of imported motifs, um, the metalware, metalware that's yeah, gold, yeah. 
the gold bowls and the silver yeah. bowls on that shipwreck, which is dated to 826. Yeah, roughly. So yeah, yeah, that's have looked at in detail at those. Yeah, I've also one of no, one well, one not one at uh, in detail, but um, uh, yeah. And the Wonaboyo Hoard. Yeah, the Wonaboyo Hoard. Yeah, the that's, Ramayana yeah, Ramayana. yeah. There is this uh, Japanese catalog that also uh, suggests that a number of these objects were are actually Chinese <laughs> uh, imported imported for China from China. Even, uh, so indeed, maybe. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think there are is some. We can make some comparisons as well. Yeah, yeah. Monica, do you think you, when you publish the book, you will be able to change the dating that is generally placed out now from a student point of view? When you're told to date Barbador, usually about 852. Was the date that was always thrown at what me. Was the thro what was the date? Uh, 852. Was often 852? Two, often thrown. Your dates may vary so much. 852 is really very late. Yeah, okay. But so when you've published your book, what date are you going to put based on your style? To Borobudur? Mm -hmm. um, I think I agree uh, quite a lot with Du Marcet, who. Um, he places Borobudur, um, he starts, he dates it from 775 to uh, slightly after 830. Well, I agree with it slightly after 830 because that corresponds with my Ijo Plausan style. I think his 775 is, uh, is too late and I think it's based on this general idea that the uh, the Dieng and Gedong Songo temples, which are small temples, and because they are small, they are considered to be the beginning because they're small and you should develop from. This is based on this I kind of linear ideas of line linear development that it should go from small to complex. Uh, but um, I think they were began to work on stone because they began with Borobudur to work in stone. Borobudur is the kind of monument that you want to build in stone. It it's should be there. It's a monument you want to build for eternity. Uh, that's when they, I think, they began to work in stone. And uh, yeah, so my my later <coughs> dating of Dieng and Gedong Songo also corresponds actually better with the inscriptions that are found there. So in Dieng, inscriptions have been found from around 803. It also, that would then be perfect, I think, for me, <coughs> because this would be the period of Rakai Varag, and Rakai Varag, well, uh, Sundberg thinks that was the person connected with Borobudur, but Rakai Warak is called the one who is, um, yeah, the term is difficult to explain, but let me say worship at Kailasa. And Kailasa is Kailasha, and Dieng is the Kailasha of Java. So um, that seems to be me, to me to be a connection. And, uh, and these inscriptions are from this uh, period. Uh, uh, but I see in being, I see two periods actually. I see a period um, in between my Sevu and Ijo Plausan period, and I see a period that is uh, uh, from the same time and same style as Laura Jongram. So, and that's it's Hindu, so that, yeah, that seems to fit in my idea of the history, but you should be careful to not fit your. What, yeah, so I, I want actually to see what I see and then only go to the to the to the history, so that I'm not going to let myself be influenced by the history. But that's difficult, of course. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the relation between. Chamba and Chavanese art, because I studied in Chamba. 
No, that would have been very nice, of course. No, not as far as I know. You get references to Cham people, but that's as far as I know in a slightly later uh, period. You get reference to queer people, Cham people, uh, people from Kaling, uh, various types of people. Mm -hmm. But it's later. Yeah. <coughs> Unfortunately, there are not that many uh, inscriptions from Central Java, and the majority of the inscriptions are from the very late period, from the period of Kayu, Kayu Wangi, so that was the one who was connected with Lord of Jongrang. He, so that's also interesting, actually, because uh, s scholars or historians who are looking with a more historical perspective and are using these inscriptions a lot, they suggest that it's that period when Java became powerful. But to me, and it's because then it seems they were trying to manage more, then you can get that information from the inscriptions. They're trying to control the larger regions. This is based on these inscriptions. In the earlier time period you do not get so much of that inscriptions but I do not see in that later period where these people who use inscriptions see this centralization I do not see it in the art I do not see this centralization in the art it seems to me they were working on Loro Jongrang and then on a few other temples that are seem to retreat to upper regions uh, So that's interesting also. Um. <laughs> Sounds like there's a party happening at seven. So, well, thank you very much, Marika, and um, thank you all for coming.